Hey there guys, what's going on with you? Welcome back to another review with me, Ben Rojan, aka The Seattle Data Guy. Today we're gonna to talk about seven words data engineers hate. And by that, I mean words that maybe you haven't even heard of now or never had to use if you're just starting out in your career, but eventually you'll slowly learn to have a distaste for them. Let's start off this list with the word reconciliation. Now, what that generally means in data engineering context is you're likely creating some sort of table, that eventually goes to a dashboard. And at some point, actually multiple points, throughout that process, you will be checking the data to make sure it matches. So for example, you should be doing some form of reconciliation as you're creating the analytical tables that you kind of do some general aggregations to make sure, hey, from the analytical side to the transaction side, all the numbers make sense. Now this can be somewhat time consuming, but it can be automated. So this is generally not where the issue comes up. Generally, at least in my experience, the issue comes up as you're creating reports. Now, either the numbers that you're pulling out don't match the numbers in the transaction system. I have this currently happening with a client where I only have access to the analytical tables that are being produced by the application itself. And the transaction tables are different than the ones that are being produced by another company. And thus, as I'm trying to reconcile these numbers, I basically spent a whole day just trying to figure out why the data that I was pulling didn't match under the assumption that the other company was creating accurate data, which they weren't. So that's one kind of frustrating issue. Let's make it even worse. Generally, the issue arises, at least the one that we really hate, when you go bring a dashboard that an analyst or someone else has created to an executive meeting, an executive looks at the number and is like, hmm, I feel like that number's off. And then they'll pull some secret report that either their team manages for themselves or from somewhere else that they have no idea where they've Hold it honestly. And they'll be like, oh, look, these numbers are off. And now because they're off by 30 cents, you're gonna now spend the next week figuring out where that 30 cents is. Reconciliation. Now let's talk about a word. Well, really two words that have kind of taken the data world by storm, so to speak, at least for the last month, because data contracts is somewhat connected to them. Schema changes. Again, you've worked at most companies every once in a while, especially if you're working at a company that builds applications, someone needs to change a table because they need to add new functionality um, or maybe they're changing features or removing them. So they either add, remove, change columns that currently exist that you pull data for. Well, now more than likely that breaks your pipeline somewhere. Maybe you've built the pipeline for most parts of it to kind of manage most schema changes. Tools like DBT, Snowflake, Delta Lake all have the ability to kind of infer schema changes one way or the other. Usually where I think this issue propagates itself most clearly is in the dashboard layer. You know, once something goes into Tableau, that's really where things start to break. Because as soon as you change something from an int to a float, certain systems just can't handle it. Especially in my SSIS days, it felt like any metadata change outside of the pipeline itself just freaked SSIS out. Like if any value changed, if a name slightly changed, they would just basically say, hey, something's changed, you need to rebuild this entire package. And so, yeah, there's a lot in terms of schema changes that just blow up an entire pipeline. And it's not just me, it's not just me. I think a lot of people feel this way. In fact, this was not even included in my original list. There was multiple comments from people that referenced schema changes. So I wanted to include it instead of some of my other word choices. Now, many of you, when you signed up to become a data engineer or software engineer, well, you thought you were going to be coding a lot of the time and building things. But what if you ended up on call for an entire week once a month? Well, that's why a lot of people in the engineering space hate the word on call because sometimes it means something you're gonna be doing once a month for a whole week where you're spending maybe 24 seven, so to speak, just checking to make sure nothing breaks. Facebook, I luckily was on a rotation where I think it happened probably once every two or three months because our team was large. And basically it was less about if things broke and it was more about data access requests. Like we just had probably four to five data access requests that we had to kind of field a day, which really do add up because you'd always have to chase down uh, different people to approve it. That was more of our on-call. Occasionally pipelines broke and you kind of had to figure it out. But for the most part, it was really just the, the tedium of having to do data access requests that made most of us go a little bit crazy. And luckily I was on an internal team. I don't even know what it would be like to be on an externally facing team. You know, if you were working on a data engineering team for the, the application itself, and if something broke there, I don't know how quickly you had to fix it. Maybe at 4 a.m. you had to wake up and deal with the problem. There were a few pipelines where that was not the case because there were executive meetings that depended on the data. But for the most part, those data pipelines could get fixed 
the following day. Next, let's talk about a word that I didn't realize so many people hated, which is backfilling. I bring this up because when I originally wrote this tweet, uh, someone responded and said that, you know, I think backfilling is the most hated word. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess it's not just me who kind of hated doing or dealing with backfills. It does kind of depend on the systems that you're working with and how complex of pipelines you're dealing with for how much you hate backfills. I think for me, the reason I ended up always hating it is because I always had to do three or four years of backfilling for data. And in Facebook, you either had to deal with a UI or a CLI um, in order to kind of kick off backfilling, but it always felt like it was limited to maybe like 500 to 1,000 jobs, which sounds like a lot, but every time you do like 30 days of, you know, backfilling for a certain table, it felt like it would always say like, oh, well, we're going to backfill a thousand tasks. So every time I had to do like one year, it was 30 day increments generally where I had to kind of break it up into. And to add to that, then you'd always have weird breakages like, oh, well, this one day didn't run correctly because there's some table that wasn't populated, so it wasn't able to run. And for some reason, that task is not in the chain of tasks that should run. So now you have to go figure out where that pipeline is. And it was just a little bit chaotic. Our team's pipelines were created in such a way that every pipeline was super well integrated. Um, that's not me patting myself on the back. We just put the term ready at the end of every pipeline and imported that ready step um, into every dependent pipeline. That extra step just made Made it easier and clearer for what the thing had to run when you backfilled. But you still, again, ran into weird issues. Some were just transitory. Unlike inflation, it really was just you need to restart it for one reason or another because for some reason the job failed and it has nothing to do with the actual code. It was just all these little things that like even backfilling for three years, what seemed like a simple CLI task ended up being a day or two of just making sure you're running things, things were still actually running correctly. Once they finished, did everything run, you know, check the data quality, etc. Backfilling was always a little bit of a pain. Now, if you've signed up for my newsletter, then you probably already know the term migrations. And if you haven't, you should sign up below. Migrations, again, for people who came into the kind of the software engineering and data engineering world to build things are this work that we all have to do that tends to be very tedious and repetitive and more than likely you're gonna be doing maybe even once a year. At Facebook, honestly, every six months, I think there was at least one or two migrations happening. I had to run an entire giant migration from one data model to the next. And prior to that, they did a migration from like Oracle and Informatica for this specific team uh, to the kind of company standard of data swarm, Presto, and uh, the underlying data storage system, which is like HDFS. Besides constantly having to do migrations, the other reason a lot of data engineers hate them is because most of their work isn't very creative in this instance. You're just trying to make the thing do the same thing as the previous thing, so to speak from a functionality standpoint. Yes, it's also a great time to remove a lot of tech debt. So there is some creativity that can happen there. But for the most part, the goal is to switch over to a new system that hopefully improves some aspect, whether that be cost, um, the ability to find talent that can actually work with the system, performance improvements, functionality improvements. Uh, the example I always use is there's this uh, article from Netflix where the uh, author talks about having to switch from a more standard batch OLAP system to a streaming version because the previous system wouldn't be capable of managing the amount of data that was coming in in just a few months. So there's a lot of reasons why migrations happen. Sometimes it's just because a CTO is friends with a specific vendor. Sometimes there's just hype around a product. Whatever the reason, someone's gonna ask you to migrate and it'll look great for their resume. Depending on the company you work for, this next word may or may not impact you. Ad hoc data requests. Well, more just the word ad hoc because it could be an ad hoc data pipeline, an ad hoc data request, whatever it might be. There are plenty of companies out there where analysts are expected to know SQL and they should be essentially doing ad hoc data requests. For you. But if you're like me, you've definitely worked at companies where you were supporting five or six analysts that never wrote SQL. They understood Excel, but never wrote SQL. And I can already see some furious people writing in the comments that analysts should all know SQL, but that's definitely not the case. And that's definitely not been the standard up until maybe the last few years. And much of that was driven by fangs where, you know, I remember my friend who uh, got a job at Amazon was basically thrown a SQL book at her kind of feet and told to learn it even though she was a financial analyst. And at the same time, again, I was supporting five analysts who couldn't write a join statement. So we are often forced as data engineers to write a lot of ad hoc work for analysts, whether it's pulling out data, uh, maybe the occasional pipeline that you're just kind of needing for 30 days for one reason or another, which hopefully you don't have to build unless it's super easy, that that really does depend. And that's a great time for you to practice the question, should we build this? It can happen, and especially when you're newer to your kind of data career, it's really easy just to say yes, because it seems like the right thing to do. So that's why many of us hate the term ad hoc. Excel, probably the most popular BI data stack tool 
anyone uses anywhere. And it's terrifying how much functionality and how much you can actually shove into one set of sheets. You can start coding VBA, you can start adding crazy formulas. And then at some point, the brilliant idea comes that, hey, we should automate this entire process. And then you hand it to some poor data engineer that now needs to parse through and look through every formula, figure out all of the VBA scripts you've built and figure out exactly how to take this contraption that you've built over the last two years and translate it into a bunch of SQL queries and code. Now there's other reasons to maybe dislike Excel. And honestly, there's a ton of reasons to love it. I'm not at all on Excel. In fact, I wrote this post the other day on LinkedIn and yeah, most things do end up back in Excel one way or the other, whether it's data that comes out of Hadoop and goes into Excel or data that you've transformed, built into a dashboard and someone's just like, wow, great. Wow, this dashboard looks amazing. Can we get the data in an Excel? Yes, there's a lot of reasons as data people, we kind of do dislike Excel. Like I love it for pivot tables and, and even doing some data comparisons uh, when I'm doing maybe something quick and dirty or just some quick analysis. But once it starts becoming a production tool, there's just a lot of scary things that can happen. I mean, I've had friends that have worked at Goldman Sachs and different large corporations that have told me, you know, they are running entire funds on Excel. And they found out after three years that there was somewhere something incorrect in a formula. Excel is scary for multiple reasons um, to like data engineers. Sometimes we get asked to take them and productionize them, which is terrifying. Sometimes it's just because we are asked as data engineers to kind of take these what could be considered production Excel workbooks and translate them into some sort of automated system. Other times it's because we put a lot of effort into some sort of dashboard or maybe a table that supports a dashboard and yet it just shoved into Excel again. Whatever the case, it can kind of be a little bit of a bummer. To be clear, because I think some people take me too seriously when I write a title like I hate SQL, even though I clearly don't, I don't actually hate Excel. It's just, there are certain things that kind of like, oh man, here's another Excel workbook or report I need to somehow translate. Finally, the word deadline. Now, obviously this word is not limited to data engineers. In fact, this is almost everyone, uh, whether you're an engineer, a designer, an analyst, no one likes being put on some sort of crunch schedule. No one likes when a PM comes and checks on you a day after you kind of gave them a guesstimate to see how far you're going. Obviously there are benefits to the word deadline. I personally try to set meetings as kind of my deadlines with, with clients. That way I'm always encouraged to know, hey, I need to have something delivered by a certain date because I have a meeting. But there is something to the fact that if you have a PM who's constantly checking in on you, it can drive you a little insane. So deadlines are great. They keep things moving forward. And at the very least, if things miss a deadline, you can kind of understand why and kind of try to uh, improve moving forward. But there is something about them that can sometimes force engineers to feel pushed and pressured in the wrong direction. So those were seven words that data engineers hate. If you think I missed some, please add them in the comments below. I've got some videos on data catalogs, uh, VC, uh, hopefully finally finishing the data engineering project coming up next. Thanks so much for watching guys and I will see you next time. Thanks and goodbye.